Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to the latest episode of Geo Podcast of GeopoliticalCyprus.org. Uh, we have the pleasure today of, uh, of being joined by uh, Jalel Hachawi, uh, a research fellow at the Klingendale Institute. Um, he researches uh, North Africa and he's one of, uh, he's a leading expert uh, in Libya, among other things. Uh, Jalel, uh, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, it's a very good opportunity um, and it's a very interesting time to, to be having you to discuss as we have many uh, interesting and important developments in North Africa uh, relating to Libya, Turkey, obviously other countries, Russia, Egypt and, and so on. And uh, Yanis, before giving the word to you, I would like to start off with, um, with a question that is very pertinent and it's about um, the latest attack we had on on the al Watiya uh, base that uh, Turkey has been showing particular interest uh, lately. Um, and I would like uh, Jalel's comment on, uh, and, and perhaps his assessment on who may be behind this um, attack and, and what is perhaps the, 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 um, the reason behind the, the attack. Yeah, so this is a, a very fresh event and uh, it's, it's still early. It happened uh, midnight or 1 a.m. Uh, on Sunday, in other words, yesterday on the 5th of July. And uh, what we do know is that uh, uh, at least three strikes were uh, successfully carried out. And uh, there are reasons to believe that at least one air defense system was destroyed, probably uh, an MIM uh, Hawk. Uh, and as well as, uh, as maybe a jamming uh, system and electronic warfare device called the uh, Coral. Uh, now what I'm hearing is that the first version of, uh, of Turkey, which was that there was nobody injured and nobody killed, is not necessarily true. So we'll find out within the next day or two. We'll, we'll probably get some satellite pictures in terms of really seeing the damage. And also, uh, Turkey will have to decide whether or not it, it declares uh, or, or publishes an actual uh, list of, of, the, of the damage done. Uh, we also know that um, there were uh, ear, like ear witness reports uh, about a Mac boom that happened uh, over Sebha, which makes sense because uh, anybody who is interested in carrying out this uh, attack would be uh, deeply committed to avoiding the frigates like not approaching Watia. Watia is by the, the Tunisia border in the northwest of, of Libya. And there's every reason to try and avoid the, the Turkish uh, uh, Navy boats uh, that are located on, on the coast. So coming from the south makes a lot of sense. And this is what uh, people have been reporting. Um, and, uh, and to be honest, like I have been expecting this kind of uh, attack for a while because it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, because you want to uh, rain on Turkish uh, parade, uh, making sure that maybe you're not going to stop them, but at least make their presence as painful and costly uh, as possible and slow their uh, operation down. I would like to remind you that uh, just before this attack on the 3rd of July, there was a very incitatious, uh, very visible, arrogant, I would say, uh, provocative uh, visit by uh, the Minister of Defense of Turkey, Mr. Hussuri Akar, and um, he basically organized meetings with almost uh, just uh, Turkish personnel, almost no Libyan presence in, in, the, in the picture. Uh, he announced also that there was an intention to sign an accord that would give the permission to Turkey, uh, Turkey itself, ignoring the GNA, ignoring the Syrians, ignoring everybody else to conduct whatever military uh, operation they wanted inside uh, the sovereign space of Libya. So there was a lot of messaging that uh, people like France or Egypt or or the Emiratis would, would be likely to respond to. You want to um, re basically spoil this picture. And uh, personally, I think that there's no other plausible scenario than uh, the Emirati scenario, because the Emirati warplanes, the Mirage 2000-9 planes that have been stationed in the Western part of uh, Egypt for more than a year, and have had the history of actually striking Tripolitania, is absolutely established. Even the UN published reports about, for example, the Tajura attack on the 3rd of July, 2019, which killed 53, migrant, 53 migrants. There's no controversy almost that it's, uh, it was the Emiratis. So here, the interesting thing is that the trip was a little bit longer, so you could wonder about the 
reviewing, what kind of external help, and also uh, the intelligence uh, used was absolutely top quality. So I could imagine a country like France, typically in the circumstances that we have right now, which is a very tense uh, um, dynamic vis-a-vis -vis Ankara, France would typically uh, provide uh, good quality uh, information because the timing was super precise, the location was precise, everything was perfect. Uh, but, but also at the same time, it's not major. It's not going to prevent anything from happening. Uh, so it's just a way, as I said, to bleed Turkey, to try to turn it, to turn its experience in uh, northwestern Libya into a quagmire of sort. That would be the rational objective on the part of the Emiratis and, uh, by extension, France. And if I were them, I would try the same. It makes sense, but it's not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yannis? Uh, Jalela would like to ask you because. Uh, as uh, far as we observe uh, Libya, very similarly, but at the same time very differently uh, to Syria, there is uh, a race between Turkey, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Russia. This is the big picture of uh, Libya geopolitics. But at the same time, there is a debate, and this debate is also... Uh, very popular among the Greek-speaking people. The analysis in Greece and Cyprus is dealing all the time with that about Russia and Turkey. How would you evaluate uh, regarding the Sirti uh, offensive and the front around Sirti, these dynamics between Moscow and Ankara? What is your take on that? Well, it's, it's a tough one. I mean, uh, you know, I, the first thing I would mention was uh, that day on the 20th of June where the president of Egypt came out and announced uh, explicitly a red line. So he really committed to the red line and uh, he talked about CERT and he talked about Jufra as a, as a no-cross line. And uh, what's been very interesting is that he's had to do very little in terms of actual work to protect CERT and protect uh, Jufra. I mean, there's no Egyptian presence. I mean, the only thing that Egypt has been doing is giving access to its territory, to its ports and airports and, uh, and border to, for other people to do the work. And who are the other people? I mean, obviously it's uh, Wagner mostly. Uh, even the Libyans themselves, you have a couple of brigades that have moved from Benghazi to mobilize in CERT, but most of the work has been done by the 604, which is native to CERT. Uh, most of the actual um, protection has been provided so far uh, quite effectively uh, by, uh, by Wagner. And when I mean by Wagner, I would, of course, I'm talking about Russian uh, fighters and Russian mercenaries, uh, but also the uh, Syrians uh, that are under their command. And more and more what we see is um, the uh, Wagner people are, have the, now the ability to actually direct the Sudanese force. Uh, in 2019, the Sudanese force was uh, disjointed from Wagner, and Wagner has expressed multiple times the desire to actually incorporate them. It seems that it has happened. Uh, so <clears throat> at the end of the day, uh, Wagner is doing it. And of course, I am always against any uh, kind of uh, depiction or narrative that presents Wagner as a direct expression of the Russian state. It's not. Uh, Wagner is definitely linked to the Kremlin. We saw this in May, where a phone call between Ankara and Moscow gave rise to a major stab in, stab in the back into, like, into, in terms of hurting Haftar and humiliating him. Uh, that was the withdrawal, the, the withdrawal from uh, the Tripoli area by the Wagner mercenaries. We're talking about more than 2,000 fighters. That was a, clearly a political decision made by the Kremlin, and Wagner had to uh, comply with it. Uh, so from time to time, we'll have these moments. And I, I suspect that I can even imagine something similar happening, happening on CERT. But before we get there, Turkey will have to find enough Libyans to sacrifice their lives. Because the, the reason I keep saying that Wagner did good work is because it turned CERT into a much more difficult battlefield for the GNA, the Government of National Corps. Uh, you have snipers now installed, and more importantly, you have hundreds and hundreds of anti-personnel mines, which effectively means that 
if the GNA wants to take cert, it's going to be roughly the same effort as what it already expended as an effort, human effort, a human sacrifice in 2016, where Misrata had to sacrifice more than 600 of its own kids uh, to take cert, the same city, away from the hands of, uh, of Daesh. And if, <laughs> ironically, Wagner is using roughly the same techniques. Uh, so if, if all of that is done, like if we have enough Libyan souls that decide to sacrifice themselves for this, at some stage, we'll have another phone call between uh, Moscow and Ankara. And, and, and that will mean that effectively uh, the withdrawal will have been negotiated against something else that uh, Russia will still be able to get uh, out of the, the Tripoli government. So that dance is going to continue, and it's not enmity, and it's not friendship, and it's certainly not the same dynamic as in Syria. We're talking about Syria. It's not comparable. It's not the same uh, theater, and it's not the same dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, very interesting. Um, going beyond uh, the external powers and, and the, the patrons, if you will, um, if, you, if we go a bit deeper and look at the at the two, let's let the two entities within uh, Libya, the GNA and the and the LNA. Um, uh, let, let's talk a bit about their uh, legality and the legitimization they enjoy within um, uh, Libya and and internationally. You know, we have the GNA on the one hand uh, being the internationally recognized um, entity, uh, and we have the LNA on the other hand enjoying some legitimization and some recognition for certain international actors. Um, but um, uh, question one, what is the legitimization these um, two entities enjoy within Libya, among the Libyan people? Uh, and um, uh, an additional question, um, what is um, uh, the, the reality on the ground in terms of, uh, of the Libyan, uh, the, the House of Representatives? I mean, we see this, um, the, 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 the House Speaker, uh, Saleh, uh, you know, having these meetings with, for example, the Greek foreign minister and being represented as the only legitimate um, and um, uh, legitimized uh, leader in the country as the only elected body, the House of Representatives. But um, isn't it the case that the House of Representatives is a um, uh, divided uh, body? And how legitimized is it really uh, within, within uh, Libya? Well, Libyans are very, very fatigued. They're very tired and jaded and blasé. Uh, nobody talks about legitimacy. I mean, unless they are really like uh, super excited uh, activists are really trying to be political and win a debate, uh, in not using goodwill, but just like trying to win the debate to, to, to outshine the other person. But deep down, citizens are not thinking in terms of legitimacy anymore. They're long past that. Um, it is true. So now to me, like there's a difference between technical recognition on the international stage versus legitimacy. I would not use the word legitimacy really. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see a legitimacy in, in uh, wartime. I, the only legitimacy that I see is the number of civilian killed. For example, to me, uh, if Turkey were, or, or the GNA were to claim some kind of legitimacy, it could show the statistics of the month of June and demonstrate that the number of civilians killed that month is much lower than the month of May. Why? Because Haftar was crushed. That to me is still something that means something. It's me meaningful, it's a form of legitimacy, but beyond that, you, you have really just technical paperwork. And from a, te a technical paperwork, it is tr it's understandable why Russia and Greece and all these people invest so much in Aguila Saleh, the, the, the speaker of the House of Representatives. The original plan, I'm going back to 2015, the Shirat uh, Agreement, mm -hmm. the UN-backed plan, was to recognize uh, the, uh, the elected, but you know, it was elected in, um, in, in June, July 2014, and, and, and it uh, inaugurated itself in Tobruk in, in late August 2014. So it's long past its mandate is what I'm trying to say, but at least it was like, even despite the low level of participation in terms mm -hmm. of uh, Voter, voters, it still resembles something that you could actually justify or defend a little bit. Uh, and, and that body is effectively the lower chamber 
uh, knowing that the, the, the higher chamber is, uh, is controlled by the Muslim Brothers in, in Tripoli. And it's called the High Council of State. So the only piece in the East that is recognized in the House of Representatives. And to make matters even worse, they haven't shown up. So I'm not even talking about the boycotters, the people who out of uh, loyalty to Misrata or Tripoli have decided to boycott the body. I'm talking about the people who are not supposed to boycott. Even those haven't been showing up. And it's mm. uh, only upon very rare occasions, really rare occasions, that Aguil Asar is able to assemble them and, or, and meet Koran and, and, and make a, a vote happen. So this is really like a big project for him, even for him. Uh, so I, that... that reduces even more the legitimacy of those people who continue receiving their salaries but don't even show show up and I think that's really bad because they could at least show up you know what I mean um, not only I mean I could also talk about the fear you, they cannot really disagree with Haftar one of them uh, disagreed in July 2019 and she disappeared and she was probably killed and mm. she's not an Islamist everybody knows she's not an Islamist um, so the HOR is is like a, for me a remnant a remnant that means something, you know, I'm not saying it means less than the, the GNA or, or the High Council of State or other bodies and that, are, that are attached to the West. But you can understand why Russia and Greece and probably France very, very, very soon, because this uh, Aguilar Salah is launching a big uh, diplomatic tour across all of Europe. So you'll hear more and more from him. And, uh, and the Russians are really deeply behind him, of, of course, as, long, uh, as, as well as the, the Egyptians. So uh, the Emiratis wanted to just have Haftar. Now we have this guy, Aguil Asara, who's not that meaningful anyway, but at least he's not Haftar. And he's been used as a stick to kind of combat the coup. Uh, people forgot about the coup. There was a coup attempted by Haftar on the 27th of, May, of April this year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the usefulness of uh, the HOR, but uh, you could talk even more about the, the Qaddafists in the East that, that are going to be used in more and more, promoted by Egypt and Russia. Russia really likes Qaddafism because for them it's, it's a, a source of strength for the Russian policy in many regards. Uh, so, you know, that, that is basically the circumstance. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, Yanis, I think you have a, some interesting thoughts and, and uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, what, I, what I'm thinking lately is that uh, we see, for example, Greece's foreign policy after what happened after this failure of uh, the diplomatic support to Haftar and by the time Haftar failed to capture Tripoli is uh, trying uh, a second effort and this time this effort uh, has to do with Mr. Saleh and uh, if you see this approach, this diplomatic approach, it has to do with uh, uh, trying de facto somehow to legitimize uh, the Eastern uh, Libya. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really curious to see, is there a possibility for the upcoming years to see the scenario of Libya's partition, I mean, to have technically uh, a de facto and a de jure governments, like two states uh, within Libya? Um, yeah, first of all, I would like to say that the diplomatic sphere is very important. Uh, right. One reason it's so important is because uh, Turkey has been always very weak on that front. Turkey has been very military the way it thinks about things, it thinks that everything is technical. And it's all about executing a military task. It's not. You have the economic aspect, you have the diplomatic recognition, you have uh, the financial system, you have resumption of the oil production. You have all those technical soft issues, I would say, where typically Turkey doesn't seem to be quick enough. I mean, it's quick on its feet when it comes to the military uh, NATO Kind of discipline that it's supposed to have but not in terms of charm offensive convincing the european nations all these things uh it's very weak and that's exactly the front that the uae and france are going to exploit so you'll hear more and more about this kind of legitimacy uh paradoxically that work in terms of obtaining rec uh, recognition internationally should have done should have been done before april 2019. the only reason 
It didn't happen. It's because Haftar decided to improvise. But the plan of his backers was to take care of this stuff, which is much more important than going on an adventure that has no chance of success, taking care of the central bank, making sure that the, uh, you control the, the financial system, the, the, the dollar revenue, the international recognition, all these things. So now that it has collapsed, it's offensive, his offensive in, in Tripoli. Now, finally, they're going to take care of it. And they're going to do it without him because he doesn't understand any of it anyway. Um, so, and, and so that's why like the Greece thing is, you know, have to keep in mind that France is going to really, really help Greece a lot, as much as it, as it can, especially knowing the maritime aspect of all these things. So, um, so this means effectively that France is going to work on a policy at least for the next two years. I say two years because Macron is up for a election in May 2022. I'm quite certain that uh, between now and May 2022, he's going to do everything to try and take away the recognition of France away from Tripoli and give it to Benazi. Uh, and for him, it's not a way to precipitate the partition. He's not thinking that deeply, uh, but it it comes down to nourishing this dynamic and fueling it, in order, uh, which, which basically deepens a de facto partition so much that you end up now seeing potentially a de jure, a South Sudan 2011 kind of scenario, which really should scare the hell out of Turkey because that's the last thing Turkey wants, right? Turkey doesn't care about de facto partition if people don't travel. It uh, doesn't matter uh, if they have other institutions in the East. It doesn't matter either to Turkey too much. But now if you start playing with the possibility of a de jure partition, then the entire Turkish plan collapses because then you cannot use the argument of, of, the, of this uh, access to the ter territorial waters. And the territorial waters that it really cares about so much are all on the Eastern side. So uh, is France angry enough to... Uh, help the, you know some way or other whether it's conscious about it whether it's deliberate or not is it going to help with the process that leads to a, a, a de jure partition potentially over the next several years yes and the uae of course even more likely to um, proceed with uh, such a plan so yeah i think the de jure partition scenario is a clear and present danger and that's actually the reason turkey is so deeply interested in grabbing the old croissant so when, when, when you see Turkey obsessed with the old croissant, it's not so much about the money. Because, you know, if they had grabbed the, the Fazan, for instance, you have 400,000 barrels a day there. It's comparable to the 600,000 of the old croissant. But they focused on the old croissant because when you grab the old croissant, you get the physical guarantee that the East now cannot partition away from you anymore. Um, and that's the reason, you know, you have to take seriously any kind of attempt on the part of Turkey to physically uh, not only grab CERT, but go beyond and grab um, the Orkosan. So this has to do with the de jure. But maybe it won't succeed, and maybe, you know, the, the status quo is going to prevail for another while, and then with activist states like the UAE and France, you could potentially, I'm not saying it's likely, but it's a possibility we, should, we have to keep in mind. So, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, well... Uh, unless Yanni, you have any more uh, questions, my last question would be on the um, on the maritime deal between the the Tripoli government and the GNA and, and Turkey. And um, obviously, there is multiple aspects to this, but uh, and and this draws on on, on various things that uh, Jalel mentioned before. One is the the Jura partition, and the other is is uh, the analysis that. Um, that you made on on the House of Representatives, and um, my question would be uh, first: uh, What is what, how do you see the potential of Greece, for example, uh, reaching a deal with the House of Representatives on a new maritime deal, and how possible is it that um, the House actually can um, you know vote um, and ratify such a such a deal? Uh, agree and ratify such a deal. And um, second question, how, how uh, easy it would be um, for the, the, the Libya-Turkey agreement to be uh, somehow cancelled, um, perhaps in the context of a GNA 2.0, maybe through a new diplomatic deal, 
uh, after a political and diplomatic process. Obviously, that's a distant scenario at this point. But um, uh, what's your take on that? I wouldn't say it's a distant scenario. I would say that it's an impossible scenario because well, <laughs> Turkey is not going to accept it. And Turkey is, mm. is reality. Uh, so Turkey is not going to shoot itself in the foot by uh, accepting any kind of process that is going to question the very existence of the maritime accord. That's, it's completely obsessed with that. So that's mm -hmm. the only piece that you can be sure is not going to move. And that's also the reason, uh, the only uh, authentic dialogue that has been happening from a diplomatic perspective has been between Ankara and uh, Moscow, not with, between Ankara and Western Europe, for instance. And uh, it hasn't been happening, obviously, with the, the Arabs, uh, the conservative Arab regimes of uh, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and, uh, and Egypt. It's mm -hmm. because Turkey is married to that. And there's no, the, the notion of actually talking to the enemy doesn't exist. The only, only friends are talking to each other, which has no value. The only mm -hmm. diplomatic value begins when enemies start talk, talking. And the only enemies that do talk are Russia and Turkey, and they're not fully enemies anyway. So, um, so basically, what I'm saying is is that um, uh, the Turkey could lose it only if you have this kind of push that I was referring to, uh, which I think is is likely to happen with like very revisionist uh, states that push for some form of uh, international recognition. It's not going to be a full UN recognition, but it's going to be enough to damage. Uh, the, the apparent uh, monopoly of uh, the GNA. Uh, for example, uh, Paris could uh, decide to uh, not speak at all to the, uh, to the Tripoli government and recognize fully the government. So to, to go back to Greece, Greece alone doesn't scare me one bit, but I do know that whenever you speak about Greece and whenever I see Greece like uh, talking to Marshal Haftar as a head of state or talking to Aguirre Sara as a head of state and, and, and showing that kind of aggressiveness, uh, I, I grant it a lot of importance. I attach a lot of importance to it because I know that France is going to do the same. Mm. And once you have France and, and Cyprus and Greece, it is a mistake to think that France and, and Cyprus and Greece are going to be alone. You'll always find with the current environment in terms of far-right populism, Islamophobia, all kinds of weird forms of ignorance about the issue, you can always uh, convince other European states like Austria, the Netherlands, you know, you could always, you know, France is a very important and influ uh, influential country in terms of geopolitics. So if it decides to go the way of Greece, you'll see uh, not necessarily a majority of the EU states, but a decent chunk of them uh, go with, the, with Eastern Libya, and that will be enough to rain on Turkey's uh, parade. So that added to the uncertainty of what the US is going to do. Uh, the US is, is not a full friend of Turkey in all of this, right? It's the friend of Turkey when it comes to military matters, because it's NATO, because it's the execution of something that seems technical. But in the political realm, in the diplomatic realm, financial uh, considerations, I'm not sure that America is going to continue following Turkey. It might give a gift to the UAE. And just one gift on that front could be a catastrophe for Turkey. So I could see a very well a scenario where Turkey wins the battle, technically speaking, and uh, does everything very well in terms of saving Tripoli and still wind up uh, in the cold because uh, it doesn't seem to appreciate the importance of all those uh, soft issues, diplomacy, economy, financial system, oil, all these things. So, and this is exactly the domain where the UAE is brilliant and, uh, and the UAE is, uh, is closely associated not only with Paris, but still has influence in Washington. Very, very interesting. Uh, Yannis, any final comments? Uh, I think Jalel has covered uh, all the the aspects we we needed to cover for this geo podcast. Uh, what I want to say is that, uh, of course, there is uh, many developments uh, that we have to 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 see in order to uh, understand how the the whole Libya power complex will end up. Uh, in any case, uh, I would like to thank uh, Jalel for, mm -hmm. for this take, for this interview. It's really interesting analysis that we don't often uh, read or hear or watch in uh, 
the, the so-called Greek-speaking world, I mean in Greek uh, public sphere and in Cypriot public sphere. Zinoraz, you yes. want to... Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your time, Jalel. This was very interesting. Um, I will put a link up to our description box for uh, for your profile uh, so that people can uh, check out your work. Um, it's it's uh, really interesting work. I hope that we will get the chance to uh, speak again. Um, I'm until... talking about Libyans, unfortunately. There's a lot of divisions uh, on both sides among Libyans. Oh, obviously, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so until next time, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, keep following Geopolitical Cyprus. Uh, stay safe and well. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye.